Right, we're going to finish up chapter 11, covering the last couple of sections, really focusing on angular momentum and the conservation of angular momentum. All right, so we want to look at the angular momentum of a rigid body. Um, so a rigid body is going to be rotating around a z-axis with angular speed omega. The mass element of uh, delta m within the body moves about the z-axis in a circle with some radius. So basically, what they're saying is there's some weirdly shaped object and we're trying to figure out what the angular momentum of this object is. We can do that by looking at each specific mass element. So if I had a little small mass element here, um, and then I summed up all the mass elements together, I can figure out what the total angular momentum is. All right, so the angular momentum, um, which is L, this is Li, with respect to our origin point, which is at the center of the mass element um, in this picture, and then the Z component is also shown. All right, so the derivation of this is shown in the book. Um, because of time constraints, I just want to go ahead and show you what the result is. But basically, if you take all these mass elements, you look at their moment of inertia, you add it all together, they're all going to have the same angular speed, which is omega. Uh, so what we can do is say that the angular momentum is equal to I omega. And this ends up being a pretty important um, equation for this chapter. Okay. So basically all this is, it says angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia of the entire object multiplied by its angular speed, omega. So again, this is for fixed, or I should say rigid fixed body. Alright, so this is a body that doesn't, doesn't change, it doesn't, it's not pliable in any way, it's rigid so the mass stays um, where it is. Okay. All right, so this chart just kind of compares translational terms to rotational terms. We talked about combining them together in various aspects. Um, so let's just take a look here. For instance, you know, the rotational form of a force is going to be the torque. And we know that's going to be r cross f, so you're taking the radius vector crossed with the force. You have linear momentum, which uh, is comparable to angular momentum, which we use uh, the little l for. If we're talking about the sum or the total angular momentum or linear momentum, we're going to use the capital letter uh, P and L. We know that there's Newton's second law for both forces and for torques, so we can look at that here. It's basically, the as, or in linear terms, it's as your linear momentum changes with time, uh, and the torque is compared to as your rotational momentum changes with time. And then there's also the conservation of, of momentum. So linearly we had that the uh, momentum is constant. Well, in rotational terms, we also have that the angular momentum is a constant. And we're going to look at that a little more closely now. All right, so the conservation of angular momentum. If the net external torque acting on a system is zero, which means there's no external torques acting um, on a system. It could be rotating, but there's no additional forces acting on it or causing a torque. The angular momentum L of the system remains constant, and no matter what changes take place within the system. All right, so really what this is just saying is our angular momentum is a constant right, in an isolated system. And isolated just means there's no external forces acting on it. All right, and very similar to how we wrote the equation for the linear terms, we can write that for the angular terms. So really it just says that some initial angular momentum must equal the final angular momentum. And I could also write this in the equation that we just formed earlier. So I omega initially must equal I omega afterwards, or the initial is equal to the final. All right, so Previously, we had situations where when we're talking about linear terms, usually there's a collision occurring or some type of change. Well, the same thing sort of happens with angular terms, except it's usually not a collision. It's just usually the mass is changing location or the speed is changing or and, and vice versa. So for instance, if I had a disk, and let's say this disk has a mass, so it's going to have its own uh, moment of inertia. We'll just call the moment of inertia of the, of the disk. Um, and then let's say there's a bug that's sitting out here at the edge of the disk. So this bug also has some moment of inertia, which can easily be defined by just mr squared, because it's uh, you can just say that the bug is some point mass right over there. All right, so this is going to be the moment of inertia of the bug. So the total moment of inertia is just going to be those two added together. Um, 
so what would happen if the bug decided to travel towards the center? Right? So he's basically changing his location, which is not going to change the moment of inertia of the disk, but it would certainly change the moment of inertia of the bug. So the total moment of inertia is going to change. And that is going to in turn then change what the angular speed is. So for instance, our initial condition might be when the bug is over here and it's going to have some angular speed. And then it decides to walk in towards the center and end up over here somewhere. Uh, which means that its moment of inertia is going to change, therefore its angular speed is going to change. Okay. So if a component of the net external torque on a system along a certain axis is zero, uh, that means there's no external torques acting on the system, then the component of the angular momentum of the system along the axis cannot change. And remember, we said the direction of the angular momentum is along the axis of rotation because you use the right-hand rule to figure out what direction the angular momentum is. Uh, okay, so here we have a student has relatively large rotational inertia about the rotation axis and a relatively small angular speed. So if he's carrying two weights and he holds those weights out as far as he can, right, you're going to increase your moment of inertia, which means your angular speed is going to be relatively low. Again, our angular momentum is equal to I omega. So if this is large, this must be small. Uh, now, if he decides to bring those weights in close to his body, he's going to change his moment of inertia because you're bringing the weight closer. So if you bring the weights closer, you're going to decrease your moment of inertia, which means you must increase your angular speed. All right, so let's go and do one example problem. All right, so the figure shows a student sitting on a stool that can rotate freely about a vertical axis. The student which is a, who is initially at rest is holding a bicycle wheel whose rim is loaded with lead and whose rotational inertia, which we're saying is IWH, about its central axis is 1.2 times 10, uh, 1.2 kilograms meters squared. The rim contains lead in order to make the value of your uh, rotational inertia substantial. So the wheel is rotating at an angular speed of 3.9 revolutions a second as seen from overhead and the rotation is clockwise. So initially he is going to be stationary and this wheel is going to be rotating at some speed. All right, The student now is going to invert the wheel so that the angular momentum that as seen from overhead is rotating clockwise. All right, so basically what he does is he just flips this wheel downward which causes the rotational um, or the angular speed to be in the opposite direction. Now so its angular momentum is now going to be minus the angular momentum of the wheel because he inverted it. The inversion results in the student, the stool, and the wheel's center rotating together as a composite rigid body um, about the stool's rotation axis with the rotational inertia of such. Okay, so basically what happens is because he flips this over, momentum needs to be conserved. So he's going to start rotating along with the wheel uh, and the stool. All right, so with what angular speed, the question is with what angular speed, and this is going to be the angular speed of the body afterwards, and in what direction does the composite body rotate after the inversion of the wheel? All right, so the conversion of the total angular momentum is represented with vectors. In, in the figure, so you can see that here. So initially we have the angular momentum going up, which means the final condition must mean the angular momentum also must be going up with some magnitude. But we know that we flip the wheel, so the, so the, uh, the body, or which is the, the total, the rigid body of, of the person and the stool and the wheel, need to counteract that so that the sum of them ends up being the same as the initial. All right, so we can write this as, there's a lot of subscripts here, so I'll try to keep them sp specific. So this is going to be our conservation of angular momentum. I'm really, I'm really just starting with this initial is equal to final equation. So initially, the uh, angular momentum of the body plus the angular momentum of the wheel and this is all in the initial condition, should be equal to the angular momentum of the body plus the angular momentum of the wheel in the final condition. All right, 
So again, i, I is going to be uh, the initial, f is going to be the final state. Because the inversion of the wheel inverted the angular momentum of the vector of the wheel's rotation, we can go ahead and substitute negative the initial for the final, right, just for the wheel itself. As we know, since we inverted it, it's going to keep rotating. However, the direction is the opposite of what the original angular momentum was. So we can go ahead and replace this final with the negative of the initial. All right, so what that would look like is, let's see. Actually, while we're at it, we're going to go ahead and say that the initial for the body is 0, because initially he's not moving. Right, so if the initial for the body is 0, that term ends up being 0. And you end up getting, for the initial condition, it's only it's going to be oops, the angular momentum of the wheel initially is equal to the angular momentum of the body, which again is opposite of the, or, excuse me, we'll, actually, we'll leave it as the body. So it's the angular momentum of the body, final, minus the initial, right? We, really should be adding the final, but again, because we can replace the final with the opposite of the initial, we're going to do that now. All right, so just simplifying this, we end up with the final is equal to 2 times the initial of the wheel. So the final of the body is equal to 2 times the initial of the wheel. All right, that's just rearranging this equation here. All right. So at this point, we can go in and sub i omega in for each of our terms, because that's what we're given values for. So this is going to be i omega of the body final is equal to 2 times i omega of the initial for the wheel. All right, again, we're trying to find what the final angular speed of the body is. So really, this is the term we're trying to find. So I'm going to rearrange the equation to solve for that. All right, so omega of the body is equal to 2i of the wheel divided by the uh, moment of inertia of the body times this is the initial uh, speed of the wheel, or the angular speed of the wheel. That's omega of the wheel. All right, we can go and plug in the values that were given in the problem. So this is 2 times the moment of inertia of the wheel is given as 1.2 kilograms meters squared, multiplying that by the angular speed of the wheel, which is 3.9 revolutions a second. And we're going to divide that by the moment of inertia of the body. All right, solving this out end up getting 1.4 revolutions a second. So notice here I left it in revolutions a second. That's because the terms are going to be able to cancel out and they left my answer in revolutions a second. If you wanted to convert to radians a second at, at some point, you certainly could have. Just make sure your answer is also in radians a second. All right, that is it for this lecture and the chapter.